Good morning. I'm Pastor Steve. I'd like to welcome everyone to worship on this beautiful day that God has given to us. And we've, we've gathered to praise his name. I have a few announcements. If you look on the insert in your bulletin, uh, first of all, the call will be having an information meeting. That'll be here at our church on Tuesday evening at six o'clock. And if you're wondering what the call is, if you're wondering how you can participate as a volunteer or if you're interested in fostering children, as two of the families in our congregation are and have been, uh, we invite you to join them and join this meeting and find out more about it. Tuesday, 6 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. Also, the Stewardship Committee will be meeting on Wednesday at 530 And speaking of stewardship, on the other side from the weekly calendar, uh, you can see that we'll be having a course coming up at the end of September called Saving Grace, A Guide to Financial Well-Being. Uh, I don't know if any of you couples have ever fought about money, uh, but a lot of couples do. And uh, or maybe you fought with yourself over your checkbook. Uh, This is about... uh, putting God's principles to work as far as your finances, what your faith has to do with your finances, and how to get those in order. So um, orientation will be that Wednesday, September the 29th. And the good news is there are some scholarships available for this course. So just let me know if you're interested in one of those. All right. Let's go to God in prayer as we worship together. Almighty God, you are the one true God, and there is no other. You are all-knowing, all-powerful, always present. May we sense your presence with us today as we worship. Receive our praise and hear our prayers. Come, Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. Let's maybe join together in our responsive reading from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer, give ear, O God of Jacob. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. join together in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will the children join me down front? Good morning. So um, this morning, come on, boys. So this morning, I have my cell phone up here. Now, I'm pretty sure you all know what a cell phone is, right? Big yes? Okay. So what kind of things can we do with a cell phone? We can call people. We can text people. What else can we do with a cell phone? Take pictures. You missed that one, huh? Do videos. What else can we do with a cell phone? Is there anything else we can do with it? Can we play games on it? Yeah, that one too. We can play games on it. But what I'd like to focus on, you can order a pizza. Yes, you can order a pizza with your cell phone. <laughs> See, there's lots of things you can do. It's a very handy tool. But can I call God with my cell phone? No. Can I text God with my cell phone? No. If I were to send God a text message, what do you think I would say? Because, you know, text messages are really short. So it'd be like, um, God, I need you. And there certainly wouldn't be an LOL after that, would there? No, because it's not funny if we need God, is it? No. But what if we were just sending just a regular text message, just to say, hi, God? 
Do you think we could do that? Hi, God, I'm still here, are you? Do you think he would answer us? Not through the text message, right? But since we can't send a text message, how do we communicate with God? We can call him. Do you think he'd answer? That'd be an even better one, because if I did call God and he answered, I think I'd probably uh, fall down right then and there and faint. But how do we call him? How do we call God? (laughs) Yeah, I have him in my speed dial. (laughs) He said I would see his phone number. Okay, so what can we do to call God? We can pray. Thank you, Brayden. We can pray. And that is how we communicate with God. But sometimes we don't hear it, you know, loud and clear. Sometimes we have to listen really hard. And maybe it's a short prayer. We could still send a short prayer like a short text. We could still say, dear God, I'm here and I'm listening. Or, dear God, I have a test coming up and I need help. And he'd probably respond with, have you studied But it doesn't matter what we talk to God about. We could just tell God, you know, it's really dark. I saw a scary movie last night, and I really need help getting to sleep. Or we could just say, thank you, God, for letting me wake up and breathing this morning. Thank you for giving me life. It doesn't always have to be a request. It can be a thank you, too. So next time you think about it, and you want to send God just a short message, do it. He's listening at all times of the day and of the night. So will you all pray with me? Dear God, thank you for giving us cell phones and letting us text people. But dear God, let us remember that the best text message we can send is our prayers to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's go to Children's Church. As the children go to Children's Church and we prepare for the pastoral prayer, we're going to be doing this prayer in a different way this morning. We're going to do it responsively. Uh, You may have noticed the sermon title for the morning is, Lord, Hear Our Prayers. And so I'm going to lift up a prayer concern and then pause for a moment. And then all together, after each one, we'll say, Lord, hear our prayers. So let's go to God in prayer. Oh God, as we come before you today, we are most grateful for the privilege of prayer and for the assurance that you hear our prayers and answer according to your will. And so, Lord, we lift up these things in prayer today. We pray for those who are sick. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for those who are injured physically or emotionally. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for those who are grieving losses. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for health care workers, clinics, and hospitals. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for the businesses in our communities to pro- in our community to prosper. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for school personnel and for students. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for the churches in our community that your name would be lifted high. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for our city board and quorum court. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for the situation in Afghanistan. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for Haiti as they recover from the earthquake. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for the East Coast today as they're hit with a tropical storm. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for our military personnel around the world. 
Lord, hear our prayers. And we pray for our country and its leaders to give them wisdom and guidance. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear all of these, the prayers of your people. Thank you again for hearing our prayers and for responding as you see fit. For we commend all these prayers and all these persons to you in faith. And we pray them in Jesus' name. Praying also together that prayer which he taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture is from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. This is the word of God. I invite you to stand as we sing hymn number 526.
May we pray. Gracious God, you have blessed us beyond measure. We thank you for our families, <clears throat> our friends, our homes, this church and loving church family, the freedom to worship without fear, but above all, your offer of salvation through Jesus. We know that we can never repay you, so we ask your blessing on what we give here today. May it be used to honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. second scripture lesson comes from the first book of Kings, You're reading from chapter 8, beginning in verse 22. To give you some context as to what is happening, uh, Solomon, King Solomon's father David, had a deep desire to build God a permanent temple where the people could come and worship. <clears throat> because ever since they escaped from slavery in Egypt, they had been worshiping in a portable tent or called a tabernacle. And they had, every time they would go somewhere, they'd have to set it up. Then they would worship, then they'd take it down and go to the next place on their way to the promised land. But now that they were settled in the promised land, God said, no, it was not King David who would build the temple, the permanent temple, but it would be his son Solomon. And so Solomon has undertaken that work and he has built the temple where the people could come and worship in Jerusalem. And now he is praying a prayer of dedication for that temple. We begin in verse 22. 
Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, and he spread out his hands to heaven, and he said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart. The covenant that you kept for your servant, my father David, as you declared to him, you promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hand. Therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying, there shall never fail you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your children look to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. Therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you promised to your servant, my father David. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Regard your servant's prayer and his plea, O Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer that your servant prays to you today, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you said, My name shall be there, that you may heed the prayer that your servant prays toward this place. Hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. O oh, hear in heaven your dwelling place, hear, heed and forgive. And then in verse 41, Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a distant land because of your name, for they shall hear of your great name, your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When a foreigner comes and prays toward this house, then hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all that the foreigner calls to you so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and so that they may know that your name has been invoked on this house that I have built. This is the word of God for us today. I invite you to remain seated as we sing hymn 405. Someone has said, the foundation of prayer is being present to the presence of God. Let me say it again. The foundation of prayer is to be present to the presence of God. To know that God's presence is with you as you pray. To commune with God as well as to communicate with God in prayer. And certainly the presence of God was there when Solomon dedicated the temple. The temple had been built. The priests had gone in to place all of the things that God had commanded them to put into the temple, including the Ark of the Covenant, a box which contained the Ten Commandments in the holiest place in the temple. In verse 10 of this chapter, it says, And when the priests came out of the holy place, after they had placed all the things there, 
a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. The glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord when the temple was ready. Reminded of the story of a pizza delivery person who was called by a church to come deliver some pizzas for a gathering. And when he came into the sanctuary of the church bringing the pizzas, he walked in about 10 feet and he said, Whoa, what's going on here? What's that presence? Have you ever sensed the presence of the Lord? Sometimes the presence can be so noticeable, so tangible, that you can sense it, that you can feel it. Have you ever felt that way at a worship service before? Can you imagine how awesome it was when the priest couldn't even come into the temple because the glory of the Lord was so powerful and so tangible? Amazing. Terry Takel, who is a United Methodist evangelist who specializes in prayer ministry, said that if the presence of God was even one-tenth as real in our churches today as it was in the temple then, the whole world would know about it. God's presence. And in that presence, Solomon was present to that presence. And it was there that he began to pray. We can learn a lot about how we should pray from Solomon's prayer of dedication that day. First of all, he offered prayers of adoration. As he begins his prayer in verse 22, as he stood before the altar and he's raised his hands toward heaven, and in case you didn't know, a lot of times the Jews pray customarily that way. They will stand or kneel with their hands raised up toward heaven heaven. And so as Solomon did that, he prayed, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath. Prayers of adoration, acknowledging God's greatness. There is no God like you. And then he went on to say that the God keeps his covenant and steadfast love for his servants. God keeps his promises. We adore God because of what God has done. And they praise God, that God had brought the people into the promised land, that God had fulfilled his promise to Solomon's father, David, that Solomon would one day build a temple for people to worship. And also that God fulfilled his promise to David, that there would be someone to sit on the throne of Israel in the line of David. And so he praised God for who God is and what God had done. Verse 27 talks about God not being able to be contained. He said, Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. When it comes to the presence of God, not the whole earth can contain it or the highest of the heavens. God's presence being everywhere. God is constantly available wherever we are. And so we adore Him for being that great God. In fact, there are seven different Hebrew words that talk about how to praise God. I won't go through the Hebrew words, But one of them talks about what Solomon did, raising his hands up in adoration of God. Another word talks about lifting up hands in thanksgiving for all that God has done. Another Hebrew word talks about boasting in God or raving about God. How good God is, how great God is. Another one talks about loud adoration and shouts. In the early history of the Methodists, they had what they called shouting Methodists. And vision, that's how they praised God, with loud shouts. Another one talks about kneeling 
or bowing in reverence and honor of God. Another one, rejoicing in God with musical instruments and songs. And a final seventh one about singing our praise and adoration to God. How often do we adore God in prayer? A lot of times we jump into our prayer requests instead of acknowledging who God is. What if we were to begin our prayers as Solomon did, saying, God be praised, there's no God like you in heaven or on earth. You are all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, always present. But then Solomon's prayers go on to talk about confession, that if the people had sinned, that they could look toward the temple and they could confess their sin before God and God would hear and answer them and forgive them. Seven times throughout this chapter, he calls on different aspects of uh, God's forgiveness in different cases in which the people had sinned. If they sinned against their neighbor, would God forgive them? If they sinned against God, would God forgive them? And yet, when we know we've sinned, how often do we feel foolish and embarrassed? How often, instead of coming to God, do we want to run from God? Try to hide like Adam and Eve did, as if we could hide from God's presence, which is everywhere. So often we want to hide, stick our heads in the sand, instead of running to God so He would forgive us. Verse 33, Solomon prayed, When your people Israel, having sinned against you, are defeated before an enemy, but turn back again to you, confess your name, pray and plead with you in this house, then here in heaven, forgive the sin of your people Israel, and bring them again to the land that you gave to their ancestors. When we pray, do we confess our sins? Do we ask for God's forgiveness? Or do we feel so ashamed of what we've done, we just want to kind of crawl into a hole and hide? Do we think God's going to come running after us with a clenched fist, saying, you idiot, why did you do that again? Reminded of something very foolish I did when in those teenage years. In high school, I had a small group of friends, and uh, one evening we thought it would be a great idea to chase each other around town in our cars. And so I had my beautiful car, 74 Ford Mustang hatchback, blue, my favorite color. My friend had a different car. I have no idea what kind it was. But me and someone else, we were in the front, and a couple of other friends were in the car behind us, and we were just chasing each other around town, speeding here and there, probably. There was a great big wide street in the town we lived in, which was about the same size as Hope. And I was in the lead, and I was pouring it on, going down that wide street, and I thought, I know how to ditch him. I'll pull a U-turn. And so I started to turn, but either skidded or hit some gravel, and instead of whipping around, I started going sideways and looked out my driver's side window and hadn't realized that the car behind me was very close. And so as I turned... Here he came, smash, right into the side of my beautiful Mustang. Well, someone in a house along that street heard the crash, came running out, and started yelling and screaming, You stupid teenagers, what are you doing? Of course, we didn't have to know it was stupid. I already knew that. But nobody was hurt, fortunately. But I felt like crawling in a hole, as you can well imagine. I was able to drive the car, so I drove it home, threw the keys on the kitchen counter, and said, I'll never drive again. Fortunately, my parents were very forgiving 
and said, cars can be fixed. Foolish decisions can be changed. Thankfully, you're all right. And the car was fixed, and I did drive again, obviously. But do we seek forgiveness when we do foolish things? Or do we want to hide those things? Obviously, I couldn't hide the damage to my car. It was there for all to be seen. We confess before God, knowing that He doesn't come out shaking His fist, saying, you stupid idiot! But instead, God reaches out, knowing we've done wrong and yet willing to forgive. As I said seven times throughout this chapter, Solomon talks about different issues when people disobey God and how God, he calls upon God to forgive. And God will. So we have prayers of adoration and prayers of confession, but there's also prayers of petition and Solomon's prayer of dedication. We can call upon God anytime, anywhere, and plead with God. One of the things that Solomon talked about was God fulfilling the promises that God made to David, that there would always be a successor on the throne of Israel and the line of David, that the temple was to be completed. And O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you promised to your servant, my father, David. God makes promises. Do we pray about those promises? For example, do we pray scriptures? One scripture says that God will not leave us nor forsake us. Do we pray that? God, I know from your word that you will not leave me nor forsake me, even though maybe today I can't sense your presence with me. But God, because of that scripture, I am assured that you are with me no matter what. Do we pray asking God, for those things that we need, that our pleas would be heard. Verses 28 and following, Solomon says, O Lord my God, heeding the cry and prayer that your servant prays to you today, may your eyes be open day and night toward this house. May God be willing to be there and answer our prayers any time. You may heed the prayer that your servant prays toward this place. Hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Oh, here in heaven, your dwelling place, heed and forgive. To pour out your heart, your request before God. You can ask Him for anything. Early Christian leader Francois Fenelon said, tell God all that's in your heart as you would unload your heart, its pleasures and its pains to a dear friend. We pour out our heart to God. He asked that God hear the prayers of the people of Israel and that God would hear the prayers also, as you notice, of the foreigners. Not just the people of Israel for whom the temple was primarily built, but he talks about in verse 41 and following, if there's a foreigner who is not one of the people of Israel, comes from a distant land because they've heard about the greatness of God, your mighty hand, your outstretched arm, when they pray toward this house, Solomon prays that God would also hear their cries, their pleas, their petitions, and answer their prayers. Anyone. Coming to God. Prayers of adoration. Prayers of confession. Prayers of petition. Asking God for what we need. And then, in the New Testament lesson from Ephesians chapter 6, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul says to pray in the Spirit at all times. Solomon talked about God being aware night and day of our prayers. We're willing to pray at all times and in all times. Places. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a pastor named Mike Bickle who resigned from the church that he was pastoring at the time, and he started a place called the International House of Prayer in Kansas City, 
IHOP for short. I don't know if they serve pancakes, but they do serve prayers. 24 hours a day. Different groups come in and they have worship services all day, all night. Just like Solomon said, you could pray toward the temple day or night. God is there. God is present. We can be present to His presence at any time and pray. And also Paul told the Ephesians, pray for all the saints. Intercessory prayer, we call it. Church reformer John Calvin said to pray for others is the most powerful and practical way in which we can express our love for them. We express our love for others by praying for them or with them. Pray for all the saints, Paul said. Pray for everyone, you know, for their good, and for their benefit. And then also in chapter 6 of Ephesians, Paul said, pray for me that I might declare the gospel boldly. Do we pray for the gospel to be declared around the world? In places that are struggling like Afghanistan and Haiti. Pray that they would get the help that they need. Pray that Christians would be protected. Pray, pray, pray. Anytime, any place. Pray with adoration. Pray with confession when we've sinned. Pray with petition, asking our requests of God and praying with intercession for other people we know. And do it at all times in any place. And God will hear. And God will answer. Maybe not always according to what we want, but according to God's will. Let us pray anytime, even in that sweet hour of prayer. That's our closing hymn. Let's stand as we sing, number 496. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, the joys I feel.
Now as we go, may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.